In 1398, the founding emperor of the Ming Dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang, passed away. His grandson, Zhu Yunwen, was his successor. However, merely four years later, this emperor, Jianwen, disappeared. For over 500 years, news of his whereabouts never ceased. It was his uncle, Zhu Di, Emperor Yan, who usurped the throne. Despite some historians saying the Ming Dynasty wouldn't have lasted 200 years without Zhu Di, and Liang Qichao even praised him as an unprecedented outstanding emperor, Zhu Di himself was not so confident. As the son of a concubine, and with the name of usurper on his back, he had to ensure his position as emperor was stable. Thus a series of the world's greatest, the Forbidden City, Temple of Heaven, Yongle Bell and Yongle Encyclopedia was born. Nanjing, the founding capital of the Ming Dynasty. In its eastern suburbs lie three enormous pieces of stone. It's the steel in Yangshan Quarry. If they were upright, they would be a 70 meters tall steel that would be a staple in civilization. Unfortunately, those who came later called it something even 100,000 camels couldn't pull up. Even to this day, this enormous 300-ton steel is impossible to move. Zhu Di originally planned to erect this steel for his predecessor Zhu Yuanzhang, so as to declare to the world the fidelity of his rightful successor. Unfortunately, they could only be abandoned in the wilderness, announcing the embarrassment of Emperor Yongle's grandiosity. Similarly, in Nanjing, Zhu Di summoned 100,000 craftsmen on a 19-year project to erect an 80-meter tall glass tower to commemorate his mother, exceeding that in Yangshan Quarry, which Judy named First Tower. Over 200 years later, Dutchman Neuhof said no single building in China could compare with it. Even Hans Christian Andersen, master of fairy tales, who had never been to China, mentioned this porcelain tower covered by large porcelain bricks and glass tiles in his work. At the time, boats sailing on Yangtze River 10 kilometers away all took this dazzling, tall tower as a beacon to Nanjing. No wonder some call it the biggest porcelain product in the Yongle era. On that note, Chinese porcelain entered a new phase of development. Only more than 100 years ago did this glowing, colorful giant collapse in the turmoil of the late Qing dynasty, and the dust and ashes from its collapse shrouded the entire city of Jingling. Ever since the pleasant clink of porcelain echoed through China, 
almost every dynasty produced remarkable works that lasted through the ages and won utmost admiration. So did the Ming Dynasty create something that could compare to the tri-colored porcelain from the Tang Dynasty, the famous kilns from the Song Dynasty, and the blue and white porcelain from the Yuan Dynasty? Could Jingde Town, the stronghold of Chinese porcelain, keep up with the rise of kaolinite and carry on the tradition to become the heaviest, yet most valuable merchandise on the Silk Road of the Sea? Due to his seven miraculous voyages around the Indian Ocean, Zheng He became a household name. What most people don't know, however, is that Zheng He was the supervising officer in the construction of the porcelain tower of Nanjing. This seemingly ordinary wood came from Nanjing. Upon examination, this 11 meter long piece of wood was found to be the rudder of an ancient wooden ship. The ship was up to 150 meters in length and weighed approximately 1,500 tons, five times that of the Santa Maria, which Columbus sailed on and discovered the Americas with. It turned out this was a shipyard in the Ming Dynasty with seven large docks, Experts determined Zheng He's fleet was most likely born here. In Zheng He's age, both shipbuilding and nautical techniques were world class. Over 500 years ago, Zheng He led a large fleet with tens of thousands of people to sail directly to West Asia and East Africa. This voyage was an act ordered by Emperor Yongle to promote his greatness and mercy. Among the goods they brought, there had to be silk, tea, and porcelain. And they would have spread to even further shores along the way. Liu Warden, the Netherlands, like many European towns, keeps a low profile yet is full of character and style. The Princesa Hof National Museum of Ceramics, famous for its vast collection of Chinese porcelain, is located here. The museum's curator for Asian ceramics, Dr. Ava Strober, spent eight years living in Taiwan. This is one of our most important pieces. It's a dragon vase made in the Yongle period, in the beginning of the 15th century, painted with a very powerful dragon, typical of Yongle style. Indeed, its gaze is sharp, its claws are strong, its body formidable, and looks brave and proud. In fact, many foreign museums include a blue and white dragon patterned porcelain vase produced in the Yongle period in their collection. These soaring Chinese dragons aptly convey the budding, rearing pride of Judy's empire. And the dragon has three claws. It is definitely made in Jingdezhen for the emperor, but it, the dragon doesn't have five claws like the emperor's pieces. We can be almost sure that this was came with Zheng He on one of his voyages to Indonesia. As a product exclusively from China, these foreign countries' desire for this amazing object from the East saw no waning despite the change in dynasties. Thus, porcelain seemed to be the most ideal symbol of demonstrating the power of the central kingdom. Although the luxurious light silk and fragrant tea were similarly coveted, they lacked the long-lasting steadfastness and ability to be passed on that porcelain had naturally. Zheng He's long voyages therefore took porcelain further than any other dynasty before had, infusing it with a special mission. Jingde Town, in turn, became ever more important.
Forty-year-old Duan Peng Jin has lived in Jingde Town all his life. Every year on this day in June, he'll gather together with his master and fellow apprentices. This is my godfather and also my master. You have to interview him, not me. Not yet. Eat first. Eat first. The annual gathering is, in fact, a performance to display to tourists around the world the ancient firing techniques of Chinese porcelain. And that is only the last step in the complicated process of porcelain making. Duan Peng Jin and his master will be performing at a restored calabash kiln from the Ming Dynasty. The process and technique they will be demonstrating are almost identical to that from centuries ago. The crucial moment in this long night is here. Under the embrace of the flames, the earth undergoes intricate changes. This, perhaps, is the reason ancient Chinese porcelain is so highly sought after in the world. In the Yonglu period, there were already 58 official kilns in Jingde town. Over 10,000 workers were hired every day, and the kilns were much bigger than those in the Yuan dynasty. Despite that, porcelain was still in high demand. Despite the officials' close supervision, they were unable to stop the techniques of porcelain making enjoyed by the royalty from spreading to the general public. Hope was hidden in these haulers as the skill was passed down through the generations. Today's tourists seem to find it hard to understand the expectations and anxiety of the kiln workers in the Ming Dynasty hundreds of years ago as they fired up the kiln. Success or failure, joy or sadness, it would all be revealed when the dust settled at the blow of the hammer. Here come the porcelain. Please move aside. Here, blue and white porcelain with underglazed red design. Nowadays, in Jakarta, Indonesia, many people work and live in the port. The wooden ships docked by the shore are over a century old, yet are still in use. Goods from all over the world are unloaded here to be distributed to various places. In the Ming Dynasty, when a fleet of sails suddenly appeared over the horizon and hundreds of large ships came into view as if in a mirage, those along the coast in Southeast Asia must have thought they came from a heavenly fantasy. With the porcelain and various treasures that came with the ship, their imagination of this heavenly kingdom must have run wild. Thus the nobles there, in their pursuit of a glimpse of this heavenly kingdom, left behind footprints of their search in the place where Zheng He came from. Now everyone, come with me inside the Linen Gate for a look. 
In Dezhou, Shandong, Xiaoan lives an ordinary life. Yet through her veins flow a different kind of history. He particularly liked the outfits of Ming government officials then and wore one such outfit to have this portrait drawn in the palace. This official outfit was given to him by Emperor Zhu Di. The man in the portrait was called Padula Patala. He was king of the East Sulu state. What's interesting is that he was Xiao An's ancestor. This is Beiyin village. The descendants of the king of East Sulu live here. I lived over here when I was little. The residents here are all Muslims. Look at that stuck on the door. It's something Muslims do. Safe entry and exit, just like the Chinese New Year couplet. Over 600 years ago, the three kings of Sultana Sulu led an entourage of 340 people to China to pay homage. Judy was delighted. His grandiose acts were finally rewarded, and he ordered for them to be warmly received. However, as the kings of Sulu returned fully loaded with gifts, the king of East Sulu unfortunately died in Dezhou, forever blending into the sacred land in his heart. Some of his relatives and servants stayed behind to guard his grave. And in the Qing dynasty, they finally became people of the Qing dynasty. In the Yongle period, due to the emperor's grandiose demands, many porcelain objects produced at that time are grand and beautiful. They are unparalleled in their intricacy and often referred to henceforth as Yongle. Apart from Yongle blue and white porcelain, there is also Yongle sweet white glaze. It's smooth like jade and ice, soothing and sweet, all rare treasures. What is baffling is that despite all the unprecedented acts in the Yongle period, there never appeared a kind of porcelain that was the first of its kind, like in the Tang, Song, and Yuan dynasties. Perhaps for Judy, porcelain was a mere vessel to demonstrate his generous spirit and charisma. Even if they sailed far out to sea, they were just a gift symbolizing the kingdom's power, not merchandise to profit greatly from. In 1424, Zhu Di passed away, and the most glorious chapter of the Ming Dynasty drew to a close. Several years later, Zheng He's fleet was also locked away, leaving behind only unforgettable regrets. China returned to its closed-door policy. All opportunities were left to the Age of Discovery, which occurred some half a century later. Zhu Yuanzhang once issued an order that not one plank was to land on sea, that not even one plank could go out to sea. He did it to protect his kingdom. It is said that the ban on maritime trade was in place to prevent the political threats of the high sea. The ancestral ban on maritime trade meant Deng He could only gaze out wistfully at the sea. But China eventually became the target of the world.
1492, Columbus, who was aiming for China, accidentally discovered the Americas. In 1498, the Portuguese Vasco da Gama sailed around the Cape of Good Hope and reached India, crossing through Zheng He's old route. In 1521, Ferdinand Magellan sailed across the Atlantic and the Pacific and reached the homeland of the King of Sulu. Magellan might have died on foreign soil, but a year later, the only ship left in the fleet, the Victoria, returned to Spain completing mankind's first sail around the world. The ambitions of adventurers made for the biggest geographical discovery in the world. Some say it would be Zheng He who first discovered the Americas and Australasia. Unfortunately, there was no hard evidence, and it was meager comfort to Zheng He's regrets. In 1514, the Portuguese sailed across the tumultuous seas to land on China for the first time. A man named Colselli might be the first European to get an insight into Chinese porcelain. At that point, Colselli still didn't know how to refer to porcelain in Chinese but he bought 100,000 pieces without hesitation. He seemed to have already foreseen the fortune he would make overnight. We have no knowledge on how he bypassed the ban on maritime trade, but eight years later, the King of Portugal ordered that all merchant ships returning from the east must carry no less than one-third of porcelain in its cargo. Apparently, profitability had promoted smuggling and the ban on maritime trade was deeply flawed. Some speculate porcelain merchandise exported to Europe in the 16th century reached a conservative number of 2 million pieces. And so, porcelain, with a profit of up to 600%, finally got its own foreign name, China. The arrival of porcelain in Europe kickstarted a new trendy pursuit. The emperors of the Ming Dynasty saved all artistic appreciation behind locked doors. It was as if all grandeur and charisma was squandered in the Yongle period. The Renaissance, which originated in Italy, on the other hand, swept through Europe like wildfire. Faced with the irresistible temptations from the East, the Medici family in Florence saw its first avid lover of Chinese porcelain, Francesco de Medici. He couldn't understand why only the Chinese could create this magical product. And thus a bold idea was born. Reproduction. In the Medici family workshop, craftsmen mixed ground glass into white clay to make ceramics. They imagined that the shiny porcelain might be a kind of translucent glass. However, that wasn't the secret to heaven. And they still ended up with ceramics. Looking at Jingde Town's visitors today, perhaps Francesco's imitation of porcelain products wouldn't seem so strange after all. Late autumn 2012, Delft, the Netherlands, a small town in Europe famous for its ceramics and porcelain. Simon's wife comes from Vietnam and they have three lively, lovely children. At the influence of his wife, Simon is deeply interested in Eastern culture. He is an important painter at the Royal Delft. Mm -hmm. 
When I go to China, I was surprised by the big items they can make from porcelain. It's something we cannot do in, in, in Ireland. We are not, not able to do that. Handmade Delftware, like tulips, are seen as a symbol of the Netherlands. Upon closer inspection, though, the Chinese would find it familiar, because it did originate from Chinese blue and white porcelain. In 1567, Emperor Longqing finally succumbed to the call of lifting the ban on maritime trade. While Europeans were still troubled over the secret of blue and white porcelain, Chinese porcelain was quietly undergoing a mini-revolution in the early to mid-Ming dynasty. Dou Tai was born. Its underglaze was still blue and white, but the overglaze was of varied colors. The plain underglaze contrasted with the colorful overglaze in a competition for attention. People often say the Tsinghua period never produced any grand porcelain, yet small objects also had their unique character. Take a slow sip of fragrant tea. Admire the plants and animals crafted on the teacups. Living slow, as we call it today, captivated the ancient nobles and officials just the same. Coming to speak of it, things became somewhat complicated in the mid to late Ming dynasty. Politics was dirty at the time, halting development in all aspects. Thankfully, external threats were weak as well. And Qi Ji Guang alone took care of everything, from pirates in East Asia to defending the Great Wall in the North. Along with the powerful civil administration from Zhang Zhujiang and others, the prosperous economy barely propped up the Ming Dynasty. Despite the lingering shadow of the ban on maritime trade, like a belt on the waist, public trade and even smuggling by sea always presented hidden turbulence. The money gained from this trade might not go into the national treasury, in turn promoting the development of the craft and public from an objective point of view.
Thus, historians credited the Ming Dynasty with the budding of Chinese market economy. No wonder Ricci, the Italian missionary who came to China during this period, had such mixed feelings. All that humans need to survive and be happy, be it clothes, food, utensils, or incredible luxuries, they are in abundant production within the territory of this kingdom. There is no need for foreign import. Thus the people of this land do not believe in, nor do they yearn for the Garden of Eden. They already see the land they live on as paradise on earth. From his detached perspective, Ricci also saw the decadence wealthy gentlemen and scholars in this paradise on earth were succumbing to. And in this trend, it was no wonder porcelain went the way of the bizarre and the vulgar. Soon after Dozai came about, the five-colored Wu Tsai, deeply indicative of its period, also reached maturity. It was even more glamorous than the Dozai, with even more complicated patterns and clusters of flowers in various different colors. The problem is, the color of most dyes lose control under the high temperature of the kiln. Our ancestors must have come up with a solution one that is commonplace nowadays. The solution was double firing. First, fire the greenware at high temperature in the kiln. After removal, apply Wu Tai, then fire it again in the kiln at low temperature to complete the production process. Innovation in technology not only added more shine and color to the waning glory of the Ming Dynasty, but also laid the foundation for colored porcelain in the prosperity of the Qing Dynasty. Despite the lack of deep spiritual origins, the loud, boisterous character and eye-catching yet unrefined nature, it is undeniable that the classic, elegant porcelain, once highly revered in temples and enjoyed exclusively by the noble and the powerful, was gradually being taken off its pedestal and immersed in the general public. It was also emerging to the world as part of Chinese culture, to be exposed and studied by all. They were very surprised how advanced Chinese craftsmanship was. Until the late Ming Dynasty, Europe was still half in the dark on Chinese porcelain. Be it Italy and Southern Europe, or the Netherlands and Northern Europe, none of their attempts at replication were successful. In the end, they realized it might be easier to just build a ship and sail across the sea. Thus, following Portugal and Spain, the Netherlands, another country that lived by the sea, launched its sails and caught up with them. Unfortunately, the southern route is perilous and highly dangerous. The Dutch had no choice but to find a new route up north, yet eventually gave up. All there was ahead was snow and ice, not water. This is the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. 400 years ago, this building was owned by the Dutch East India Company. This is the meeting room. In this meeting room, the decision makers of the Dutch East India Company decided to use force to fight Portugal and Spain over the East. In 1602, they intercepted a Portuguese merchant ship, the Clark. Not only was there a large amount of Chinese porcelain on the ship, they were of a unique style and it was soon looted. The saying of Clark porcelain thus came about.
Soon afterwards, the Dutch intercepted another Portuguese merchant ship carrying 100,000 pieces of Chinese porcelain. The pieces obtained through force were sold at auction, and the Dutch East India Company soon took over the route to the east. This building was used about a couple of hundred years ago by East Indies Company. But now we use this building from, for cycle store, for the students. This may be the most valuable bicycle shed in the world. Over 400 years ago, the many treasures transported over by the many merchant ships that the Dutch built might have filled every corner here. This red castle is located in Don Shui, New Taipei City in Taiwan, nicknamed Red Hair City. Red hair has nothing to do with the color of the castle. Rather, it refers to the Dutch people who stepped foot on Taiwan for the first time in 1642. They chased away the Spaniards and became the new invaders of Taiwan. Using this as their bridgehead, they almost monopolized trade on Clark porcelain. In 1644, the year the Red Hair rebuilt this castle, the last Ming Emperor, Son Zhen, hung himself. Pinghe Fujian, located in southwest Zhangzhou, Fujian, right across the sea from Taiwan. The most famous thing here is the Pinghe honey pomelo. However, master pomelo farmer Wang would never imagine the soil he's standing on once produced something even more famous and profitable than honey pomelos. This kiln site was excavated in 1998 where they mostly discovered blue and white porcelain boxes, such as the fragments in these places. They were found in every kiln. The porcelain fragments were produced here during that period. For a long time, the actual location of production of Clark porcelain remained a mystery. It wasn't until the 1990s that archaeologists discovered large amounts of Clark porcelain fragments and up to 100 Ming kilns at this location. The so-called Clark porcelain is actually a kind of blue and white porcelain, similar to that produced in Jingde town. However, Pinghe is quite far from Jingde town. How did it manage to produce porcelain that influenced East Asia and Europe so greatly? Zhu is a longtime resident in Jiufeng town, Pinghe. He holds a deeply hidden secret few people know, Jiangxi tombs. According to their saying, this land has outstanding feng shui. Its back is to the north, and it faces the south towards Tachi Mountain. As the name implies, the people buried here mostly came from Jiangxi. According to legend, they were the ones who introduced the craft of porcelain making from Zhengde town. Moreover, under the extensive pomelo forest here was hidden large amounts of raw material for making porcelain, kaolinite. With labor, skill and raw materials, it appeared almost everything was set. Coincidentally, the final push came in the mid to late Ming Dynasty, 
when the ban on maritime trade was lifted by Long Qing. This water gate was built at the mouth of one of the branches of the Jiulong River in Zhangzhou. 60-year-old Wu spent most of his life watching the gate. It is his whole world. Wu has no idea that 400 years ago, this was Port Yue, one of the busiest ports in East Asia. Due to the lift on maritime trade during the Longqing period, Port Ye was the only approved port open for trading in the country. It's less than 100 kilometers from Port Ye to Ping He. It only takes one day for porcelain from Ping He to be transported down the river to Port Ye. After that, it's packaged directly onto ships and sent sailing around the world. In fact, the birth of Clark porcelain was probably decided by market orientation. Thus, when maritime trade was banned once again during the Qing dynasty, Clark porcelain also saw its decline along with Port Yue. Nanao Island in Shantou, Guangdong is tiny compared to other islands within Chinese territory. Yet in terms of history, it ranks near the top. Many major events and figures were connected to it. It is even said that there was treasure left behind southern Song emperors and infamous Ming pirates hidden on the island. All these stories piqued people's curiosity. <laughs> In 2007, it roused the curiosity of the entire world. Right, let's look at the latest development on the archaeological excavation at Nanao. This place, where there is most porcelain, was where the ship sank, in the middle right cabin of the wrecked ship. Nearby, at the bottom of the sea, a sunken ship from the Ming Dynasty, hidden for the last 400 years, holding up to 10,000 Clark porcelain pieces, was discovered. This isn't just legend, it confirmed all the stories. The sunken ship was less than 200 kilometers from Port Yue, filled with blue and white porcelain produced from private kilns in Ping He. Scholars deduced it was a foreign merchant ship that was unfortunately sunken soon after it set sail. In addition, certain forbidden substances and at least four ancient cannons were found in the shipwreck. So maybe it was a smuggling ship that slipped past the ban on maritime trade. Whatever the case, it represented a miniature of the changes and the ups and downs that Ming porcelain went through. We have seen shipwrecks in Asia, Africa, the Americas, and Europe. Ming Dynasty was truly an era that saw the beginning of globalization. This is the last day of excavation on Nanao 1 in 2012 five years since it was first discovered. It was excavated by the standard underwater protocol and the square fabric frame has been constructed. Archaeology team leader Cui Yong is making a drawing of Nanao One's appearance underwater as a conclusion to the year's work. This one, this one here. Check, check this out. Check this area here. Yeah, I see it. Uh, did you write that one down? Got it. Throughout the entire Ming Dynasty, porcelain never seemed to have won the special favor of the royal family. 
Not only was it revised from official history, even Ricci only mentioned it in passing. Yet porcelain existed everywhere, both inside and outside of Chinese territory. Saying it was in its heyday couldn't even describe a fraction of its popularity. Yet this popularity was often accompanied by a ban. The ocean signified both hope and desire. It was a conflicted era where things were not all they seem on the outside. Perhaps because there was only one Judy, or perhaps because, by chance, nature was allowed to run its course. No matter what, feudal China was entering its final age of glory. Under its constrictions, porcelain took on a path of diverse extremes as well. The age of discovery finally knocked on the door of this heavenly paradise. And the exclusivity of Chinese porcelain, which lasted 1,500 years, was a mystery no more. Despite being in different countries, it barely hung on by a thread. Step into the dark corners of 300 years ago, where historical secrets are hidden deep in ancient scrolls. Suspicion, jealousy, adventure, flight. It is the final porcelain story, changing kilns.